If it goes through the keyhole, it will hit us April 13th, 2036. The chances of this now, our data tell us, is several in a million. But there are people who buy lottery tickets with worse odds than that, expecting to win. It'll hit Santa Monica, it'll explode. 50 feet tsunami, five story tall, that will come to the west coast of North America and basically wipe it clean. clean. Imagine cruising through a vast space minefield. That's pretty much what Earth is doing every day. Neil deGrasse Tyson, a big shot in the world of astrophysics, gets the heebie-jeebies when it comes to asteroids. And honestly, it's easy to see why. These aren't just the stuff of epic sci-fi movies, they're real, and they're out there zipping around in space. We're talking about chunks of rock and metal, leftovers from the solar system's early days, some of which could be on a collision course with our planet. But what exactly are we dealing with here? Well, it's a mix. You've got asteroids that are no bigger than pebbles, and then you've got the big kahunas, ones that are the size of mountains or even larger, and they're all just floating around in space following their paths around the sun. The thing is, their orbits can be a bit like a pinball machine, unpredictable and at times downright dangerous for Earth. These space rocks are fascinating in a way, they're like time capsules holding secrets from billions of years ago when our solar system was just taking shape, but they can also be a bit scary. After all, a big enough asteroid smacking into Earth could be bad news. We're talking about potential global consequences, from tsunamis and earthquakes to climate changes that could really shake up life as we know it. Have you ever thought about the times Earth has played cosmic dodgeball with asteroids? Let's talk about some of Earth's most dramatic run-ins with these space rocks, starting with a biggie, the Chicxulub impactor. Picture this. About 66 million years ago, a giant asteroid, about 10 kilometers across, comes hurtling towards Earth. It crashes into what's now the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, and boom, it unleashes energy like billions of atomic bombs, creating a crater 150 kilometers wide and 20 kilometers deep. The aftermath? A global climate shakeup, and about 75% of Earth's species, including the dinosaurs, say their final goodbyes. Fast forward to a more recent event, the Tunguska explosion in 1908. This wasn't a direct hit, but it was still a showstopper. An asteroid or comet fragment, maybe about 50 to 60 meters wide, bursts in the sky over Siberia. The blast, with the power of 10 to 15 megatons of TNT, flattens a whopping 80 million trees across 2,150 square kilometers. That's an area bigger than some major cities. And get this, there was no crater found. Scientists think the object just blew up mid-air, about 5 to 10 kilometers above the ground. The Tunguska event is a bit of a cosmic wake-up call. It showed us that these space rocks can be pretty sneaky and unpredictable. It wasn't like we had a heads-up to brace ourselves. This unpredictability is why keeping an eye on the sky for asteroids is super important. You never know when the next big one might make an unwelcome visit. Let's get into the fascinating world of asteroid tracking, where scientists become cosmic detectives. Imagine trying to keep tabs on space rocks cruising through our solar system some of which might get a bit too cozy with planet Earth. This task is a blend of astronomy, physics, and some serious sleuthing. So how do you track a hunk of rock zipping through space? First, you gotta spot it. Scientists use beefy telescopes, both chilling on Earth and orbiting in space, to catch a glimpse of these celestial wanderers. Once they've got an asteroid in their sights, it's all about measuring where it is, how bright it is, and how it's moving compared to the stars. This info helps work out the asteroid's orbit, speed, size, and where it might be heading. The process, called astrometry, is like celestial cartography, mapping out the positions and paths of these space rocks. But spotting an asteroid is just the start. Predicting where it's going to be in the future is a whole other ball game. It involves some hefty math and computer simulations. Scientists juggle the laws of how celestial bodies move and toss in factors like the pull of gravity from other planets, the asteroid's own twirl and shape, and even how the sun's heat gives it a gentle nudge, something known as the Yarkovsky effect. One of the big players in this game is NASA's Near-Earth Object Observations Program. These folks are on a mission to find and track at least 90% of the near-Earth objects out there that are 140 meters or more in diameter, the kind of rocks that could really ruin our day if they hit us. Then there's the European Space Agency's HERA mission, gearing up for a 2024 launch, 
Hera's going to take a close look at the Didymos asteroid system and its little buddy Dimorphos. It's like a follow-up gig to NASA's DART mission, which is testing out if we can actually shove an asteroid off its course by ramming a spacecraft into it. But here's the kicker. Tracking asteroids isn't a walk in the park. There are loads of them we haven't even found yet, and some are tough to track because they're small, dark, or zipping around super fast. Plus, space is huge, and asteroids are like needles in a cosmic haystack. Have you ever thought about how Earth has had some really close calls with asteroids? These near misses are like nature's warning shots, reminding us that we're just a tiny part of a vast, dynamic universe. Take the Chelyabinsk event in 2013, for example. This was a real eye-opener. A relatively small asteroid, just about 20 meters across, came out of nowhere and exploded over Chelyabinsk, Russia. The blast was massive, releasing energy around 30 times greater than the Hiroshima bomb. It wasn't just a light show, the shockwave broke windows and even damaged buildings, injuring over 1,000 people. It was like a scene from a movie, but very real and pretty scary. This event showed us that even a small space rock can pack a massive punch, but Chelyabinsk isn't the only time Earth had a narrow escape. Let's rewind to 1908, the Tunguska event. An asteroid or comet fragment blew up over Siberia, flattening about 80 million trees over a massive area. It's like Mother Nature showing off her power. More recently, in 2021, we had asteroid 2001 FO32, about 900 meters in size, cruised by Earth. It was 2 million kilometers away, which sounds like a lot, but in space terms, it's pretty close. What's tricky about these cosmic wanderers is that they can be hard to spot. They're like stealthy space ninjas, small, dark, or sometimes hidden by the sun's glare. This makes predicting their paths quite challenging. Scientists are constantly on the lookout for these elusive space rocks. Projects like PanStars in Hawaii and the Catalina Sky Survey in Arizona are like our cosmic watchtowers. They're scanning the skies, trying to spot any potential threats. And then there's NASA's NEOWISE mission, using an infrared space telescope to find asteroids that might be too dark for regular telescopes to see. But here's the catch. Our tech isn't perfect. We're pretty good at spotting the big asteroids, but the smaller ones, like the one that hit Chelyabinsk, can slip under the radar. With millions of these small near-Earth asteroids zooming around, it's a bit like finding a needle in a haystack. Now let's wade into the mysterious world of asteroid impact conspiracy theories. It's a place where wild speculation meets a sprinkle of imagination, and sometimes it can clash pretty hard with scientific facts. These theories have a bit of everything, from hush-hush government secrets to alien shenanigans. One popular tale you might hear whispers about is that governments or big space agencies, like NASA, are sitting on a gold mine of secret info. They supposedly know about a doomsday asteroid on a crash course with Earth, but are keeping it on the down low to prevent mass panic. It's a theory that could be straight out of a thriller movie, but when you shine the light of science on it, it kind of falls apart. Here's the thing. Keeping an eye on asteroids is a huge international effort. We're talking about a network of observatories and agencies all around the globe, constantly watching the skies. Keeping a secret of this magnitude under wraps, highly unlikely. Then there's this other out there idea. Some asteroids zipping through space are actually alien spacecraft or probes under the watchful eye of extraterrestrial beings. It's a theory often fueled by the weird shapes or paths some asteroids take. But in the world of astronomy, these oddities usually have more down-to-earth explanations like natural erosion, cosmic smash-ups, or just the simple tug of gravity. And let's not forget about the theories that suggest some shadowy groups or governments are cooking up secret plans to either weaponize asteroids or use them for some sort of space-age power play. While the idea of redirecting asteroids is a genuine scientific pursuit, the notion of using them as cosmic weapons is more sci-fi than science fact. It's important to remember that these conspiracy theories, as entertaining as they might be, can sometimes cast a shadow over the real, critical work happening in asteroid tracking and planetary defense. This field is all about open collaboration and sharing knowledge. Scientists from around the world team up, share their findings in peer-reviewed journals, and keep databases like the Minor Planet Center up to date with the latest asteroid orbits. Plus, there's Asteroid Day an annual event where space experts gather to spread the word about asteroids. 
It's all about education and transparency, showing just how open the field of asteroid research really is. So while it's fun to entertain these space rock conspiracies, the truth is often more grounded and collaborative. It's a global effort where scientists are the real heroes, working hard to keep our planet safe from any unwelcome cosmic visitors. What if I told you that we're actually cooking up plans to save Earth from a Hollywood-style asteroid catastrophe? It's true. Scientists and engineers are working on some pretty cool strategies to deflect a rogue asteroid heading our way. This isn't sci-fi anymore, it's real science in action. Let's start with the big guns, nuclear deflection. Now, this isn't about blowing an asteroid to smithereens like in the movies. Instead, it's about setting off a nuclear explosion near the asteroid to gently push it onto a different path. It's like giving the asteroid a little nudge away from Earth. This could be a game changer for dealing with big asteroids, but it's also a bit controversial. There's the whole unpredictability of nuclear blasts in space and the risk of breaking the asteroid into smaller, yet still dangerous pieces. Then there's this super cool idea called kinetic impactors. Think of it as playing interstellar billiards. We send a spacecraft to smash into the asteroid at high speed, which changes its course. NASA's got this project called DART, the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, where they're actually going to try this out. They're planning to whack a spacecraft into an asteroid's little moon to see if they can change its orbit. It's like a real-life experiment to test out our planetary defense skills. Another nifty idea is the gravity tractor. Picture a spacecraft just hanging out near an asteroid for a long time, using its own gravity to slowly but surely pull the asteroid into a safer orbit. It's a slow and steady approach and less likely to break the asteroid apart. But it's a bit like watching paint dry, it takes a long time. And get this, some folks are thinking about using solar sails or even lasers to push asteroids away. These methods are more about gentle nudges than big shoves. Solar sails use the pressure of sunlight, while lasers would vaporize part of the asteroid to create a little jet stream pushing it off course. These ideas are still in the early stages. Why don't you throw in asteroid defense? We need some of that. We just have a fast-moving object is kind of like a bomb when it makes contact. Fire one of those 18,000 mile an hour bolts. Correct. Out. And then the thing blows to multiple bits. All right, let's talk about the Egyptian pyramids, especially the Great Pyramid of Giza. These aren't just a bunch of stone blocks stacked together. They're a mind-boggling blend of mystery, history, and some serious engineering skills. Now picture this. You're in Egypt around 2600 BCE. It's the fourth dynasty, a time when the pharaohs were really into building epic stuff. And here's the kicker. The pyramids were likely built not by an army of slaves, but by a well-organized workforce. We're talking skilled laborers who knew their stuff fed well and probably worked in shifts. This flips the script on how we think about ancient Egyptian society and their ability to pull off such massive projects. But how did they actually build these giant wonders? That's the million dollar question. Historians and archeologists have been scratching their heads over this for ages. Some say they used ramps, others think it was levers or maybe even clever water channels to move those megastones. But here's the thing, no one's found a smoking gun to prove any of these theories yet. Now let's add some recent plot twists. Archaeologists have dug up a workers' village and some ancient papyri that give us a sneak peek into how things might have been done. These finds are like ancient construction logs and lifestyle blogs rolled into one. They show us how the workers lived and hint at a pretty sophisticated management system. And get this, the pyramids, especially the big guy, the Great Pyramid, are lined up with the stars. We're talking precision alignment with Orion's belt. This tells us that the ancient Egyptians weren't just master builders, they were also stargazers and possibly deep thinkers about the cosmos. So what we've got here are not just piles of stones, but a symbol of ancient Egypt's tech savvy, their social structures and their cosmic curiosities. The more we dig into the pyramids, the more they reveal about a civilization that was way ahead of its time. They're like a four, five, zero, zero year old puzzle that's still challenging us today. Now going underwater, let's talk about Atlantis. The legendary city Plato chatted about way back in ancient Greece. He described this place as some kind of super civilization. Think advanced tech, big ships, and a whole lot of power. But here's where it gets spicy. Was Atlantis an actual city that got a one-way ticket to the bottom of the ocean, or was Plato just spinning a yarn with a moral twist? The hunt for Atlantis is like the ultimate treasure hunt. People have been looking everywhere. The Mediterranean, the Caribbean, even way out places like the Azores and Antarctica. But guess what? No one's found a shred of proof that Atlantis was a real place. It's like the world's most elusive. Where's Waldo? 
Now, with all our modern gizmos and gadgets, like underwater archaeology tools and satellites, you'd think we'd have found it by now if it was out there. But nope, Atlantis is still playing hard to get. This hasn't stopped us from being obsessed with it, though. Atlantis isn't just a possible ancient city, it's a cultural icon. It's in movies, books, and all sorts of theories about what went down in ancient times. What's really cool about Atlantis is that it keeps our imagination fired up. Was it real? Was it just a story? Either way, it's a reminder of how fascinating and mysterious human history can be. Atlantis is like a symbol of what we know, what we don't know, and what we wish we knew about the ancient world. Whether it's fact or fiction, it's a story that's not going anywhere anytime soon. Now moving on to the Indus Valley Civilization, a real brain teaser from ancient history. This civilization, which popped up around what's now Pakistan and India, was super advanced for its time. We're talking about a place with cities like Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa that had killer urban planning, drainage systems that would put some modern cities to shame, and even multi-storied brick houses. These guys knew what they were doing when it came to city life. But here's the kicker, their script. It's like ancient code that no one's been able to crack. These little symbols on seals and pottery could tell us so much, but they remain a mystery. It's like they left us a message we just can't read. They were also pretty savvy with their hands. The stuff they made from seal carvings to metallurgy and pottery shows they had some serious skills. But then, around 1900 BCE, things started going south. Cities got abandoned, and that impressive urban life just fizzled out. What happened? Well, there's a bunch of theories. Maybe the climate changed and they couldn't grow enough food. Or perhaps earthquakes shifted the rivers and messed up their farming and water supply. And then there's the idea of invasions, but there's not much to back that up archaeologically. Archaeologists are still digging up clues, trying to piece together how these folks lived, what they traded, and how their society worked. And it's not just archaeologists, linguists, environmental scientists and a bunch of other smart people are in on this too. The fall of the Indus Valley Civilization is one of those great mysteries that keeps historians and archaeologists up at night. Despite all the stuff we've dug up, the big question, why did it all come to an end, still hangs in the air. It's a reminder of just how complex and intriguing ancient human societies were. Let's talk about the Nazca Lines in Peru. These aren't just any old lines in the sand. They're a massive collection of artworks that you can only really appreciate from way up in the sky. We're talking over 800 straight lines, 300 geometric shapes, and around 70 designs of animals and plants. Imagine drawing a giant spider, monkey, or even a shark in the desert, and not being able to see it from above. That's what the Nazca people did between 500 BCE and 500 CE. Now, how did they do it? They scraped off the top layer of reddish-brown pebbles to reveal the lighter earth underneath. The precision is mind-blowing especially since they couldn't hop in a helicopter and check out their work from the air. So, why did they make these lines? That's the million-dollar question. Some think they were for astronomical purposes, like lining up with certain stars or celestial events. Others reckon they were part of rituals to get the gods to send some much-needed rain to their dry desert. There have been some wild theories over the years, like ancient astronauts using them as a sort of airport, but there's not much to back that up. With today's tech like drones and satellites, we're getting a better look at these lines and discovering new ones. They're so important that UNESCO stepped in to protect them, making sure these ancient artworks stick around for future generations to puzzle over. The Nazca lines are more than just drawings. They're a testament to human creativity and our desire to leave a mark on the world. They keep historians and archaeologists guessing and remind us that there's still so much we don't know about our past. Let's dive into the mystifying world of the Voynich Manuscript. This thing is like the ultimate puzzle from the 15th century that no one has cracked yet. It's filled with writings in a language or script that's like nothing else on Earth. Linguists, cryptographers and even AI have taken a crack at it, but it's still as mysterious as ever. The manuscript is not just a bunch of strange text. It's got these wild illustrations, plants that don't match any known species bizarre astrological symbols and oddly drawn human figures doing who knows what. It's like a window into a completely different world, but without a guide to help us understand what we're looking at. The history of the manuscript is like a game of hot potato through time. It was once owned by the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II, and it's changed hands countless times since. 
Everyone who's gotten their hands on it has been entranced by its enigma. As for what it's all about, theories are all over the place. Is it a medical textbook from another world? A secret alchemical guide? Or maybe the world's most elaborate prank? Nobody knows for sure. The best brains of both the past and present have tried to decode it, but it remains a stubborn mystery. The Voynich Manuscript isn't just a curiosity. It's a symbol of the mysteries that our history still holds. It challenges us, teases us with its secrets, and keeps us guessing. Every page is a reminder of how much we still have to learn about our past and the depths of knowledge that remain unexplored. All right, let's chat about Stonehenge, that big circle of rocks standing on the Salisbury Plain in England. It's not just a bunch of stones, it's a prehistoric enigma that's been boggling minds for ages. Built over a whopping 1,500 years, Stonehenge's true purpose is like a puzzle missing half its pieces. Now these weren't just random rocks tossed together. The builders were onto something big. They lined up these massive stones with the solstices and equinoxes. It's like they had their own ancient version of an astronomical calendar or a sky map. This suggests those ancient folks knew a thing or two about the stars. But wait, there's more. Dig a little around Stonehenge and what do you find? Human bones. This led some brainy folks to think maybe it was an ancient burial ground, kind of a VIP cemetery for the big shots of the time. There are a ton of theories out there about Stonehenge. Was it a religious site, a prehistoric party zone, a healing ground? We're still trying to piece it all together. And while we've dug up some clues, a lot about Stonehenge keeps us guessing. What's really cool about Stonehenge is how it keeps our imaginations running wild. It's not just an ancient site, it's a symbol of mystery, a reminder of how our ancestors tried to make sense of the world around them. So, while we might not have all the answers about Stonehenge, it's definitely one of those mysteries that keep the past intriguing and alive. Dive into the world of the Terracotta Army, an epic archaeological treasure that's like a time capsule from ancient China. This isn't just a bunch of statues, it's a whole army of life-size terracotta warriors buried with China's first emperor, Qin Shi Huang, we're talking thousands of soldiers, each with a unique face. No cookie cutter molds here. These figures are a showcase of ancient Chinese craftsmanship and technology. Each warrior, from his hairstyle to his armor, was crafted with incredible detail, making the whole army not just a protective force for the emperor in the afterlife, but also a display of the empire's power and skill. But here's the kicker. The Terracotta Army is just one part of a massive complex that's like a version of the Emperor's Palace underground. It's all part of this grand plan to keep the Emperor safe and comfy in the afterlife. A testament to the ancient Chinese beliefs about life after death. Archaeologists are still digging up new stuff there, and every find is like a puzzle piece giving us a clearer picture of ancient China. It's not just about how cool these statues look. It's about understanding the people who made them, how they lived and what they believed. The whole terracotta army thing is fascinating. It's like a blend of art, history and mystery, all wrapped up in clay. It's a reminder of how advanced and complex ancient civilizations were, and there's still so much more to learn from them. Every time you think you've got it figured out, the terracotta army throws another curveball your way. And as always, we hope you enjoyed our video today. Thanks for watching.